Hey guys, my presentation this week is on the double-crested cormorant. It's known by the scientific name Phallocrocorax auratus, and this was NJ seashore species number 5. Okay, so they're a large, uh, been described as prehistoric looking diving seabird. Um, they have a 70 to 90 centimeter length, their wingspan is 130 centimeters, and they weigh uh, 1,700 grams. They have lean, long, uh, gangly bodies with uh, relatively short wings. They've got hooked, long beaks and wedge-shaped tails, and they have black webbed feet with short legs. Uh, juveniles are white-breasted to brownish-black with dark bellies, and they have a yellowish-orange bill and face. And adults have uh, like this mattish, like brown-black plumage, and they have a yellow-orange face and dark bills. Some up-close detail here of a breeding adult. Uh, they have these stringy double crests on their head from which they get their name. These crests can be white or black. Uh, they have these really striking blue eyelids during breeding seasons, and they have dusky bills, and a yellow-orange throat sac and face lores. Lores are the part of their face that's like extending from their eyes down to their bill on like the upper part of their beak. And over here we have a wintering adult. They have brown eyelids, that striking blue is gone. They have yellowish bills. Uh, and their throat sacs can have more of a reddish hue. This individual doesn't seem to really have that though. And most notably, when they're wintering, they don't have these uh, nuptial crests on their heads. All right, the double-crested cormorant is mostly found within the United States, continental United States. Um, they have a few different populations, so the continental inland and North Atlantic breeding populations will migrate to the south and the southeast during the winter. The western breeding populations, so west of the Rockies, will uh, migrate to the Pacific coast. And there are populations in Florida, the Pacific Northwest, and in coastal Mexico that just don't migrate at all. They're year-round residents. And these guys are common in marine and inland waters, and they require water for feeding and perching. And they can be found resting and drying on rocks, cliffs, sandbars, wood pilings and docks, anything that can give them a, a bit of a vertical height to see things over. Okay, I'm just going to briefly touch on a few aspects of their behavior. Uh, they're gregarious and highly social. They'll form large flocks and uh, mixed species colonies and you can see them flying in linear or the, that like classic V-shaped formation. These guys are like master swimmers and, and fishers and divers. They fish underwater, they're powered by their, their webbed feet, and they usually swim on the surface with most of their body submerged in the water. Usually you can just see their head and neck sticking out of the water. And when they dive, they'll dive from the surface and they'll go down up to 7.5 meters, which is like almost 25 feet and they can do that for anywhere from like 30 to 70 seconds and their diet is almost entirely fish they've been observed eating over 250 species of fish but they've been known to occasionally eat crustaceans amphibians and some insects as well and they can often be seen on shorelines uh, with this sort of like a real elegant looking uh, spread wing type of a perch. They're, they usually do this after diving and uh, when they're resting. And this, they it's thought that they do this to help them dry their feathers out, but they're not so sure, certain because uh, captive cormorants that don't have to dive for their food will still engage in this behavior. And I just want to touch a bit on their population trends and how humans have sort of shaped that recent history. So from the 1800s to the early 1900s, they were persecuted heavily as a pest species. They're often shot on sight, and as a result, the population declined, especially as Americans expanded westward. Uh, beginning in the 1940s, their populations declined further from indiscriminate use of pesticides via biomagnification, uh, which is when 
a species low on the food chain consumes something with a chemical and that chemical is amplified up the food chain uh, and causes severe problems in some higher trophic predators like eagles and in this case the double crested cormorant. Uh, DDT caused their eggshells to thin and uh, other birth defects. In 1962, an environmental scientist named Rachel Carson published the book Silent Spring, which is pretty much like widely credited for jump-starting the modern environmental science movement. Within it, she accused pesticide companies of downplaying the harmful effects of their products and also called out government officials for failing to take that into account in policy. And about 10 years later, after you know, like mounting public pressure, activism, and lawsuits, DDT and, and other pesticides were banned in the USA. As a result of that, uh, from about the mid-60s through to today, double-crested cormorant populations increased explosively. Some colonies in the Great Lakes have been observed doubling in size within five years. So that's very rapid population growth. Today, it's estimated that there's more than 740,000 breeding birds in the United States, and they're actually even considered a threat to aquacultures like fish farms and stuff like that, and to other colonial birds. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will occasionally even permit controlled shootings of them if they feel their populations are getting a bit out of hand. And I just want to wrap up with... Uh, real brief quote from the book Silent Spring. Uh, it's really good. If you haven't read it, uh, I'd suggest it. So this is from the beginning of the book, and it's basically saying that the chemicals to which life is asked to make its adjustment are no longer merely the calcium and silica and copper and all the rest of the minerals washed out of the rocks and carried in rivers to the sea. They are the synthetic creations of man's inventive mind brewed in his laboratories, and having no counterparts in nature. To adjust to these chemicals would require time on the scale that is nature's. It would require not merely the years of a man's life, but the life of generations. And even this, were it by some miracle possible, would be futile. For the new chemicals come from our laboratories in an endless stream. Almost 500 annually find their way into actual use in the United States alone. The figure is staggering, and its implications are not easily grasped. 500 new chemicals to which the bodies of men and animals are required somehow to adapt each year. Chemicals totally outside the limits of biologic experience. So I found that to be a pretty powerful quote, and just because it came out in the early 60s it doesn't mean it doesn't apply today. If anything, I feel it applies even more with stuff like these polymers like PFAS that have been found to have you know pretty negative environmental effects and are found in all sorts of living things, including people. So, yeah, I don't know. Just thought it would be nice to add that in at the end. All right, and just to follow up on that last point, I actually was just on the EPA's website, and I looked up that there are between 1,500 and 2,000 new chemical products released to commerce each year in the United States. So it's uh, tripled or quadrupled since Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. Uh, that's not to say that they're all negative for you or for the environment, but it is to say that I don't believe there's any way that we're actually taking the time to properly investigate the environmental or potential negative long-term effects of a lot of these. Uh, okay, anyway, that was my presentation. Here are my sources. Have a good one.